do you think that Tinder could break a person's spirit? Well, it's going to be a different case for this guy because he managed to match with his late wife on Tinder. Hi everyone, welcome to the Grumpy Goose. My name's Jam and uh, this is going to be a new series that I'm going to be doing. It's going to be about spooky stories and urban myths. Anything that sort of catches my attention online or anything that I find really interesting, I'm going to bring along here, make a video, and I'm going to read this out for you as well. This story is about a man who matched with his late wife on Tinder. And a lot of other things sort of start going on. I've only seen part one and part two of this um, when it came across my attention on TikTok. And I was really frustrated there was no part three or part four. It might have been part three and four, but it, they weren't easy to find at the time. And I got frustrated and I thought, right, you're going to get a video and it's going to show all parts. And you can see the whole story as it unfolds here. But let's get on with the story. Part one. I had numbly swiped left so many times in a row. I almost missed it. I wished I had. My wife Alison had been dead for two full years, yet there she was on Tinder, smiling at me, in a photo I'd never seen, looking older than she did when she passed. All of the air went out of the room. I skimmed through the rest of her profile, there was no writing, but three other pictures of my dead wife I had never seen before, including one with the Statue of Liberty behind her, even though I knew she had never been to New York City at least to my knowledge. The profile had the right name, the right after for if my wife had just kept living after July 2020, but her location was nine miles away. I swiped right and breathed for the first time in nearly two minutes. I can probably breathe a little bit more than that, mate. I struggled to sleep for the next 48 hours, never getting a match, ready to message Tinder and tell them someone was impersonating my beloved dead wife on their app and doing some kind of magical photoshop to put her in pictures that never existed. The match came at 3.33am, lighting up my phone. I was already awake. The match came with a message, just a simple, Hi. The absolute worst in any situation, let alone this one. I mashed the letters on my phone as hard as, as fast as I could. Who is this? Why are you doing this? And where did you get these pictures of my wife? You died of cervical cancer two years ago, you monster. I had to wait another 24 hours before I got an answer. It came in the middle of the night again. Derek, I miss you. I'm sorry for what happened. That was it. Sorry for what happened. She died of natural causes she in no way could have controlled. And I was supposed to believe that my dead wife's spirit decided to inhabit a Tinder profile and hit me up on it. I got another message as these, thought, as these thoughts ran through my head. Are you home? <clears throat> what? What the frig? I got another answer before I could form my own. <clears throat> I'm outside. My blood ran cold. Something rattled in the darkness of my kitchen. And I jumped up and readied myself in bed, then realised it was just ice dropping in the ice maker in the freezer. Another message. Holy sh**. Let me in, please. What? Someone had to be f***ing with me. But who would be this impossibly cruel and diabolical? There may have been a couple of people who didn't like me at work, but no one would go anywhere near this far. Another message. <clears throat> Never mind. I got in. I had the front door of my house closed and I tightened up in my bed. I started to write back. Why? I'm a dumbass. I don't know. Another message rang in before I could shoot mine off. You're on Tinder <clears throat> too soon, Derry. The pet name only the two of us used between each other. The logistics of who knew that name flashed through my head as I heard footsteps approach my unlocked bedroom door. 
Then the footsteps stopped right outside. They were accompanied by a fresh message in my inbox. You were supposed to mourn me, not try to f 23 year olds on Tinder. Oh my god, I realised right there that it was even following Alison's quirk to impeccably punctuate any kind of message even if it didn't matter, putting the dashes into 23 year old. I spoke, finally. Alison, I'm sorry. I love you, I miss you. I've been sick to my stomach for two years, but I had to move on. I threw up most mornings for almost a year. I was wrecked. I couldn't work. I couldn't do anything, but I'm finally starting to put it together. I pleaded into the wood of my bedroom door. My throat went dry. I couldn't speak anymore. Too choked up. Just like I had been when I tried to give Alison's eulogy. I'm f***ing sorry. Everything hurts. Every. Day. You're my only love forever. I barely got the words out. I couldn't hear or see anything, but I could sense someone out there on the other side of the door. Then I couldn't. Then I heard footsteps walk away. Then I heard my door close again. I checked the app. I had a message waiting for me. Okay. <coughs> Goodbye. Exo. I felt like my spine tried to climb out of my body. My entire being went numb. I couldn't feel anything other than an odd disconnected pain. It was her. I walked out to the front door and looked outside. There were no signs of life. Probably bad phrasing there, mate. I went back to my phone in the bedroom. Alison's profile had been deleted. I felt okay. Until a couple of nights ago, after I came back from a date with a 26-year-old, I met off of Tinder. Came home tipsy after a few drinks and a makeout session in my car on a high. I checked the app to see photos of the girl whose tongue had just been in my mouth and noticed that I had a new like. I had my account on premium so I could see who it was. It was Alison again, but with the same profile. She was only one mile away. I swiped right. Let's see where this goes. Part 2. I stepped on a dead bird when I walked out my front door to go to work in the morning. I picked up my heel and looked down at a snuffed out robin that had just been underneath my foot. Or boot. I thought nothing of it until I found another dead bird. This one, a fat brown little sparrow, deceased at my feet. The sparrow and the robin were just two of what looked to be a dozen dead birds strewn around the entry and front yard of my home. This couldn't have been an accident. My pet name for my wife was Birdie. I took the lead this time, messaging Alison on Tinder. Who is this, really, and why are you doing this? I've been through enough already. I had to sweat out the longest day of work of my life without an answer. I was numbly eating my signature dinner of spaghetti carbonara that I could make with just five ingredients in just 15 minutes when I got it. I miss the smell of your carbonara, and it's me. I could tell you something that only I would know. Alison shot another message before I could reply. Your secret favourite song is All Too Well by Taylor Swift. I had never told another soul that. Another message from Alison before I could think more. I miss you so much, Derry. You really made my life special. I tried to hang on. You were the last thing I thought of and it made me happy. I truly felt loved. I could feel your hand holding me strong. Sorry I couldn't hang on. My throat went dry and tears fell on my phone screen as I read her message a few times. Those last moments we shared at her bed at the hospital... That rhythmic beep of the heart monitor still played in my head. I took my time to think out what to write back to her. Now actually happy that she had found some digital afterlife way to contact me. Alison, there's no way to properly write out how grateful I am for the life I was lucky enough to share with you. I miss everything about you. I miss the way I could catch you looking at me with starry eyes when I walked across a room. 
I miss the way you talk, like you're telling someone a secret, even when you're not. I miss watching your reflection on sunny hikes. Honestly, I can't write anymore. I'm sure you can feel what I feel. I know that. Sometimes I feel like you're still here, even before this. Alison replied in just the amount of time it would take someone to read that message twice. I have been there. What? A message came across as eerie and endearing at the same time. He went on. You know when you set your keys down somewhere and then can't find them and then they are somewhere you swear you never put them? Or when you feel like there were five shrimp in your stir fry and then suddenly there are only four? Have you ever felt warmer all of the sudden while you're crying on a rainy night? It was at that moment I realised I hadn't turned the lights on in the house, but it was almost nightfall. I sat there in the dark, crying into my congealed spaghetti, wondering if Alison was watching me right there, or if this was just the world's cruelest prank. The buzz of another message nudged me in the dark. I'll step away. Sorry for causing you any grief. Alison. XO. I let that sit there. It felt right. But I also had to do some housekeeping. The thought of Alison lurking over my shoulder and sifting through everything in our house dug a burning hole into the lining of my stomach. I grabbed my computer, went out to my car and drove into town. I stopped in the parking lot of the nearest grocery store. I took out my computer and started deleting everything I would never want Alison to find on my computer or my phone. Random old p I had downloaded. Some pictures with a couple of flings I embarked on since she passed. It honestly wasn't that much. I was back home in less than 20 minutes. Everything felt right until I went to open our bedroom door and found a small pair of red underwear wrapped around the handle. The image of their former owner burned into my mind and turned my entire head red in a flash. I saw the girl in my mind, small, bubbly, very drunk, at the bar I went to with my high school friends. She was there with her friends from high school too. One thing led to another. We went back to my house, spent the night together. I think she could pick up on the sadness inside me and try to cheer me up by leaving her lacy underwear on the floor like she forgot them. I threw them somewhere in my closet and forgot about them, honestly. I started to panic. I started to think of a response. I also started to feel like I had downed an entire bottle of... Nickel? Nickel? Nickel. Okay. Sorry, I had to check on uh, Google how you pronounce that one. I didn't want to pronounce that one wrong. Nickel. My thoughts got slow, my eyelids got heavy, every muscle in my body became sluggish. I felt drugged. Well, judging by it, you just drank cough syrup, like to try and help you sleep. Alright. I dropped down hard on the floor, unable to make it to the bed. Lying on the floor, struggling to just stay awake, I felt my phone vibrate in my pocket. I used the last of my strength to reach into my pocket and get my phone out. I had a message from Alison, which I was able to read on my home screen. I'm glad I put what I did in your dinner, when you weren't looking after what I found when you left guilty. We loved each other, Derry. Why did you do things like that? My final molecules of waking energy were enough to, for me to take in that message. Then I passed out. I woke up on the floor hours later, still groggy, but alive. The very first thing I did when I woke up was check Tinder. Allison's profile was deleted. Part 3 I never found out why Allison drugged me, other than to just mess with me or get back at me for the incriminating things she found on my computer, or phone, or in my closet. I kept waiting to get a notification on Tinder that I was liked by Allison. I kept paying for the stupid premium accounts so I could find out, but it never happened and months went by. I kept waiting for something strange to happen in our house, it never did. The power went out because someone hit a power pole in my street, that was it. Life went back to normal. One of the girls, Bibi, 
I casually talked with on Tinder. Just before Alison's profile annihilated my world, stepped into my life. We started hanging out regularly, though always in public or at her place. I held off having her at my place as long as I could. I thought about telling the, her the situation and then scrapping the, that idea. It's far too crazy. Months had gone by without a peep from Alison, and I was finally comfortable having Phoebe over. I invited her over for dinner. I had talked up my five ingredient 15 minute carbonara and she really wanted it and this red wine I had been talking about. Phoebe and I hadn't slept together yet and I was getting major vibes that this was going to be the night. So I decided to make everything perfect and that got me deep cleaning my place. I was cleaning out a coat closet when I found Alison's old MacBook. It was stored above the jackets on a ledge underneath board games, which hadn't been dusted off since when she was sick. Just looking at those games flashed cosy nights on the couch underneath a blanket and sipping drinks through my head. I felt a little warmer than I did before. The MacBook provided a momentary distraction. I sat down on the couch and started going through Alison's files. I knew she saved her favourite photos and videos there. I didn't have much time, with Phoebe coming over soon, so I just skimmed through the thousands of photos and videos and fought back tears. It was all going sadly and sentimentally smoothly until I saw a large chunk of bare skin in a swath of photos. Alison's bare skin. I stopped on the photos. I had never seen them before, at least I don't think I had. Alison was either nearly naked or close to naked in them and posed seductively but not graphically. Think old school playboy photo shoots. They were all in a fancy hotel room I, don't, I didn't recognise. I saw some cityscape through a window but couldn't make out which city it might be. The f*** was this? Who took these photos? I dove into the photos and examined everyone like a skilled detective looking for any clue I could. I got the biggest clue. Okay, so like the Hardy Boys in South Park. All right then. I'm relief I ever could have gotten when I got to the last one and it showed Alison naked, sitting on, my, on the bed, holding a sign written in cursive that read, I love you, Derry. Oh, okay, crisis averted, back to cleaning the house. This wasn't to say my suspicion wasn't still raised at least a touch. Would throw in that last one photo with a sign in being a cover your ass move in case I found the photos which were intended for someone else. It's at that point I should divulge that Alison and I didn't always have the most perfect relationship and neither of us were pillars of mental stability. Alison grew up in a hard luck family. Her mum had her at 19. And her dad split very early and she barely knew him. He only came around for occasional life events and lived somewhere in Florida, possibly on a boat. I didn't care enough to get much more and he didn't care to volunteer. Her mum was fine. She wasn't the cliche young single mum who had been, had a bunch of abusive boyfriends or anything. She held it down just fine and always had a job and avoided significant others. The problem was Alison's extended family. They were all bad news and always lurking around. Particularly her sister Sophia, who was a dark cloud that seemed to always blow in at the worst time with sketchy friends and ruin things. Alison also had her fair share of mental issues, nothing completely crippling or diagnosed, but she always had a mix of numb depression and sporadic manic anger. She didn't let it hold her back though. She got through college, always had decent jobs, and met and married the upstanding individual that is myself. I had my own fair share of issues myself. On the surface, I had a very clean-cut, middle-class, suburban upbringing. One look under that one look under that veneer showed a dull, dull darkness of seemingly contagious anger and depression. More on that later, though. Our issues tended to help us in some ways. We could lean on each other and understand each other in the hard times. Then sometimes we couldn't. 
The blowout fights were epic. The worst came just three months before our wedding. I can't even remember what sparked it, but we ended up screaming at each other all night. She called off the wedding, even though all the save the dates were already pinned on all of our loved ones' refrigerators. The deepest regret in my life, which keeps me up at night, is the cruelest thing I said to her in that fight. I told her she didn't actually mean that much to me. She had just been convenient at a time in my life when I had nothing going on. It was a movie I watched on an airplane and would then forget about. I didn't mean that at all. I was just so hurt after the things she said to me in calling off the wedding then that I thought of the cruelest possible thing I could say at that moment and it came out of me. Regardless if you didn't mean it either, like, you shouldn't say something like that. Anyway. The wedding was off for a few days. We just never told anyone about it. We patched things up and were golden by the time we walked down the aisle. This was all running through my head when I was on top of Phoebe in my bed. It was definitely affecting me. I was barely there. I was kind of just going through the motions until it was finished. Phoebe didn't seem to pick up on my troubles. We laid in bed for a while chatting before she asked to shower. I then embarked on one of my muscle memory rituals. Usually after sex with Alison, she went to the shower and I went to the bathroom in the front of the house to pee. So I wasn't peeing right in front of her. I did this with Phoebe, walking naked through our home and into the guest bathroom. Thinking back now, I thought I did notice something peculiar in the kitchen. A moisture, the smell of gas. But that could just be my brain putting together pieces that weren't there trying to figure out what had happened shortly after. Had I paid closer attention to the kitchen, I wouldn't have noticed the pot filler on the stove. Had I filled, had filled up a pot that was resting on a burner and the gas burned had been put on high. Or the gas burner had been put on high. But I didn't. I walked right by and back to the master bathroom. Phoebe asked me if I wanted to shower with her. I did. I slipped into the shower. It was warm, comforting, and beautiful. It must have been about 45 seconds before the boiling water came over the side of the shower. The boiling water mostly hit Phoebe's back as she had her head down the shower nozzle hitting the nape of her neck. I watched her reach back as the scalding water scorched her, and I watched the soft skin on her back liquefy and slip away as she clawed at her back in a pain frenzy. The water caught my shoulder and I got the same treatment, a searing pain and the smell of burning flesh right under my nose. I yanked Phoebe out of the shower and wrapped her in a towel. She screamed and heaved in my arms as my eyes combed the bathroom for our assailant. I didn't see anything but I saw something written in the fog of the bathroom mirror. I watched everything. Part 4 Phoebe thankfully accepted that the shower incident was an issue with the water heater. She apparently didn't see Alison's message on the bathroom mirror. She understandably walked away from our relationship after that night though, and I didn't fight to keep her around. I needed a break from anything intense anyway. A few weeks later, I awoke in the middle of the night to the sound of a baby crying. I knew where it was coming from, and I knew why it was there. Alison wanted nothing more than to have a baby, and I wanted to give that to her. We tried shortly after getting married, and it didn't take long to get pregnant. He knew it was a girl. We painted the guest room pink. We bought girls' baby clothing and a pink crib. We set it up in the guest room, even though there was still six months to go. We, would never, we were never happier. Alison miscarried. That's all I'm capable of writing about the situation. We kept trying after that with no success, and it actually led to the discovery of her cervical cancer. The most painful part of me couldn't help but wonder if the cancer came from or had something to do with the miscarriage. After the diagnosis, we just tried to enjoy each other. We didn't get much longer together. I walked to the closed door of the guest room and could hear the baby crying on the other side of it. I gave it a second wallowing in the pain of it all before my anger with the world boiled over inside me and I threw the door open. My brain was prepared to see the room empty. 
the way it had been seen since the miscarriage. Instead, I saw that pink crib in the far corner, and I saw Alison standing there in front of it, her back to me, dressed in her sheer nightgown, fabric barely clinging to her frame. It broke my heart to see that she was looking down at nothing in the crib. The sound of the baby crying stopped. It was replaced by Alison's familiar, staggered whimper. I was no longer scared. I was sad. Alison spun around and saw her face for a breath, her pale green eyes dancing across my vision for just a second. She sent a piercing scream at me. Then she was gone and I was alone. Worse yet, I felt something walk past me while I was standing there in the door, numb. Is it her? I cleaned out all the baby stuff the next day and donated it. We had hung on to it in hopes that we would have another one and that was never going to happen. In the collection of baby stuff was a box of congratulations cards from after we told our family and friends that we were expecting. A card from Alison's cousin, Leisha. Triggered by memory, Leisha was a medium. The skeptic in me wanted to write off Le Leisha? Let's call it Leisha. Uh, the skeptic in me wanted to write Laisha off, but I wanted, but I hadn't told her I was coming. We've had photos of Alison already, already waiting on her working table, in her living room that smelled like stale weed. She told me, she knew I was coming. Alison hadn't contacted her, but she had felt her presence in the weeks before. Laisha explained to me that at some point in the history of their family tree, that Allison's family crossed something they should have not should not have crossed, and their bloodline was infected by a curse that carried all through every member of the family. It seemed that even those who weren't as afflicted by the internal demons as others, like Allison, something tragic always happened to them. Fatal car accidents, brain tumors, heart attacks at a young age, cervical cancer. Everyone was dragged down into the darkness somehow, even if they tried to fight it by succeeding in life. Laisha com comforted me by explaining there was nothing I could do for Alison, and I did the best that I could, giving her love while I was able. She held my hand while explaining all of this. I told Laisha about what had happened that uh, had been happening with me and Alison. She took a long hit off a vape after apologising for doing so, and she shook her long, frizzy hair into her face. She gave herself time to connect with whatever she was channelling. She squeezed my hand impossibly hard for a woman who looked like she couldn't have been more than 100 pounds soaking wet. Leisha explained that Alison's family being around when she passed onto the other side was not a good thing. She thinks their dark energy infected her as she passed over, and she may have been infiltrated by a darkness or a demon on the other side, and now that darkness was taking over her and pushing her towards me. She also explained that darkness or demon lived in the cancer that killed her, and it may have been affecting her from the very first sprout of it. Getting into her brain, creating that anger that hurt our relationship, she insinuated something about the miscarriage but stopped herself. She went into that ghosts are souls that feel unresolved with their life and the world at linger trying to hang on to it and demons can act like parasites. Using those lingering ghosts to get back into and negatively affecting the living world. This may have been what was going on with Alison. Laisha explained the only way to start keeping the last shreds of Alison's stolen and shredded spirit was to get rid of every single thing I was holding on to that was her, physically and digitally. I didn't want to do it. She assured me it was the only way. She also said I had to get rid of the tattoo Alison gave me. What? Laisha gave me a mirror and showed me the tiniest little letter 
A etched in black ink behind my left earlobe. I remembered a scab and pain there just after the boiling water incident in the shower. I wrote it off as part of the scalding and healing process and had never looked behind my ear. She explained Alison must have given it to me around the time I was sleeping. Aisha also insisted I moved out of the house we lived in together. I agreed and followed through with it, moving in with my parents. I went back to the house and started cleaning out all of Alison's things. I donated as much as I could to charity. The last piece was my wedding ring. I stopped wearing it after a year, but it kept it in my nightstand. This was the one recommendation I didn't completely obey. I didn't get rid of it as she suggested. I put it in a safe deposit box at my bank. I just couldn't bear to not have it exist in the world. I experienced some grace at my parents. I was there for a week with no disturbances. I finally got some good sleep. Got some work done. Started eating again. We had a wonderful dinner at home with my parents the first Sunday night after I moved in. Three glasses of wine, three full glasses of wine made me feel good and put me in the, mo in the moment. That wine helped me drift off to sleep and keep me there for some quite some time. But not through the entire night, drinking always made me have to get, get up and pee in the middle of the night. I was in the bathroom when I heard the sound of music. Music lured me out into the dark living room, and I realised it wasn't music. It was Alison's voice coming hushed out of the echo dot in the room. It was so low I couldn't make it out what she was saying. I drifted over to the corner of the room where the Alexa was to try and listen. There was a lit candle flickering next to the Alexa, the flame seeming to flicker with the rhythm of the soft words coming out of the device. I didn't remember the candle being on when we went to bed. Closer to the Alexa, I could make out the words coming out of the machine. I heard a fragment of the wedding vows Alison and I read to each other. My emotions swelled in my chest, and in unison the dozen other candles in the room ignited with strong flames, casting the room in a pale light all around me. For a second, I saw a glimpse of someone standing in front of me, next to the Alexa, but then a swift gust of wind came through and knocked all the candles over, and the image of the person was gone. The candle in front of me fell in onto a framed photo of my parents with Alison and I, smiling on our wedding day, standing in a golden field on a summer afternoon. I watched the frame and photo set ablaze with incredible speed. Still frozen, I heard Alison's voice on the Alexa switch from, switch from reading to simply crying. Those familiar, familiar sobs filled my ears and started to get louder and louder the longer I stood there. The flames started to build all around me, yet I still couldn't move. I heard my mum scream from behind me. Alison's cries got louder on the Alexa, as if they were trying to compete with my mum's screeches. My mum was able to yank me out of the room, and we were able to get out of the house. The fire department got there soon enough to save the house with only some moderate fire damage. I went to see Leisha immediately. She was waiting on the front porch of her house, even though it was just daybreak and I hadn't told her I was coming nursing a cup of coffee and a freshly killed bowl of weed. Laisha took me inside and sat me down. She grabbed me by the face and pulled mine closer to hers. I'll share the words she shared with me. Alison loved you. She would never have done any of these terrible things to you, but this is no longer her. That darkness has taken over her spirit. There is still some of her and her light deep down inside her. Sometimes it cracks through and sends you some of that sweetness which made you love her. But it will always now only be brief. You can't hang on anymore. You can keep her in your mind and your heart. But that's the only place she can live for you. Otherwise this evil spirit will take you down with her. You'll both be haunted. I had to get let go of that wedding ring. 
I went back to our house. I remember there was one more thing in addition to the wedding ring of Allison's I hadn't brought myself to purge yet. I also had to get rid of. Allison always wore the same perfume. I left a bottle in the bathroom back at the house because I couldn't bring myself to throw it out. Keeping her scent was one of the things I really didn't want to lose. I would spray it periodically to remember her. I pu pulled the perfume bottle out of the bathroom cupboard and started to carry it out of the room. I was almost to the door when I tripped and fell. I fell into the counter with the perfume bottle in my hand. The bottle smashed into the edge of the sink and shattered. A jagged edge of the bottle was slashed across my hand, ripping open my palm. Some of the liquid of the perfume splashed up into my face, landing in my mouth, stinging my tongue. I straight up inhaled some of the perfume, choked on it, coughed profusely, and squeezed my cut hand, trying to stop the bleeding. Allison's perfume seeped into my body through the cuts in my hand and the liquid soaked my mouth. I shook it off. The wounds on my hand didn't require stitches and that awful taste eventually evaporated off my tongue. I went to the bank and got into my safe deposit box. The only thing in there was my white gold wedding band staring at me as soon as I slid open the drawer. I scooped out the drawer and slipped it onto my ring finger. How loose the ring, uh, ring was on my finger crushed me. Alison was an excellent cook and not having her around cooking for me and my general depression since she got sick had whittled down the girth of my fingers. The thing would barely even stay on my finger. I intended to take the ring, uh, take the thing right back off. I didn't, yet I walked out of the bank with it on. That's when the descent started. I was in a living room while the fire damage at my parents was repaired. It was one of those mid-range chain hotels by the airport without the least bit of charm or life and perpetually dim. My room was at the top floor at the very end of the hallway and it became my dark sanctuary from the world. I stopped going to work. I stopped hanging out with my parents. No friends, no apps, just me. Sitting in my room and barely turning the lights on. I can hardly even remember what happened during that time. Like a movie, I can only vaguely remember watching. Bits and pieces come to me, and I can see little snippets of that time. But they feel like I'm watching li my life, not participating in it. What I do remember is a feeling. Being locked in that room in the dark and just my thoughts and emotions. And those feelings were painful and destructive. I thought about breaking the window and jumping out. I thought about driving, drowning myself in the bathtub or throwing the TV plugged into the bathtub while I was in it. I thought about the steak knife that came with my room service la one night and what I could do with it. My parents and Leisha rescued me. They came to my door one night and wouldn't let me not come out. Leisha took a photo to show me how terrible I looked. Sunken dark eyes, ashen skin, my hair coated with grease. I looked like a person who'd be living on the street instead of a holiday in express. But then came the worst part. I had only been in the room for a little over 48 hours. It was like my deterioration was in warp drive. I'd seemed to age 10 years in a day. Whatever came into, into through the perf that perfume had carried me to hell. My parents were major sceptics and were freaked out about Leisha contacting them because she was worried about me. However, they were completely understanding and open-minded about the dark power of everything that had happened with Alison, so they let Laisha in the room with me, alone. Laisha examined me with a horrified look on her face the entire time. I was just starting to come to, and the dire nature of the faces and, she, and sounds she was making were throwing me into a panic. Leisha was going to have to do an exorcism. The power of darkness was too deep inside of me to do anything else. Going and throwing my wedding ring into the river wasn't going to be enough at this point. I thought it was going to mean just lighting some candles, burning some sage, holding some crosses, and make some pleas to the Holy Spirit. Leisha quickly informed me this was not the case. 
I watched as Leisha pulled out a syringe, a vial of clear liquid, and a r little rubber hose. A setup that looked like it would be for shooting hair. She told me the liquid was holy water, and she pulled out a blindfold. I didn't believe in God. So how was that holy water going to work? She explained the darkness could be affected by something that simply believes in being clean, being holy, being a light, and not a dark. Holy water was the best way, it was the best she could do for even though she didn't believe in God either. Leisha blindfolded me and tied me to the bed. I didn't know it was coming when she slipped that syringe into my arm. I got the biggest head rush of my life when she dropped the plunger down and I felt myself melt into the soft mattress of the bed. I suddenly couldn't move, everything was dark, but I felt like I was riding on Space Mountain, cutting through the darkness at breakneck speed. Then it all started to slow and a familiar voice drilled into the back of my head. It was Alison, the old Alison. Derry? As of so her soft voice, kind again, floored me. I couldn't answer before she spoke into me again. What happened? I took in a deep breath that felt like I inhaled the entire universe into my suddenly heavy chest. I started communicating back to Alison's spirit in the void. You've been torturing me. You've ruined my life. You have to stop. You have to let go of me. But please don't let go of me. It couldn't hurt more to do what I had to do. I was surprised I was strong enough to start forming the statements in my head that I did. I won't forget you. But I have to let you go, buddy. I'll never forget you. I'll let go of my hold on you, and you have to too. She didn't respond. Please, Birdie, I have to go on. I'm falling apart. That's not me who's torturing you. I know. I know your pain. I love you. My clear head followed me to feel something I didn't, I don't think I would have had or felt without Leisha's assistance. I could feel that darkness seeping into Alison, like it was filling her blood. I felt it was getting injected into her like that holy water into me when she took those pregnant pauses. I could feel the rage building. I could feel it sucking me into myself. I started to lose my cool. She stopped placing words into my mind, and instead I fell into the feeling of her pulling me deeper into the hole I was in. I started to feel like I couldn't fight it anymore. Then the voice came into my head, but it was lower, colder, and darker this time. Just stay with me. It was a dark whisper in my ear, and I wanted to give in to it. I could just let go. It would be easy. It would be nice to stay with her. I felt her nails dig into me, and something switched inside of me. The pain, the sting of it, it was familiar, and it woke me up. I'm sorry, I have to go. Alison stopped talking again. Instead, she just dug those nails deeper and deeper into me. And I fought it. I pushed myself away, out into the space, into space, into nothing. I apologised one more time, without words, and then I felt myself float away. I felt Alison's rage turn to sadness as we parted ways, and I felt control to start, start to come back to my body. I could feel it was her. This was not the family darkness. Not what took over her. Not that demon. It was just her and she was saying goodbye now. Goodbye, Derry. I love you. I'm sorry. All of the feeling returned to my body just as I absorbed hearing what I always needed to hear. I was ready to go back. I could feel myself crossing back to being in that plain hotel room by the airport. I could hear Leisha's voice calling me back. I didn't say anything, but I reached my arms out as far as I could, and for the slightest, softest of moments, I felt my hand brush against Alison's. Feeling the rough scrape of the diamond on her engagement ring press into the side of my hand. I woke up on the bed, Leisha's face pressed up against mine. Relief was washed all over her face. How do you feel, she asked, plenty of wary still on her face. 
I felt the best I had in a really long time. I felt like I truly exercised a demon. Holy water could really do all that? I asked Laisha instead of answering her question. No, that was Ket, but I just didn't want to freak you out, Laisha explained. I didn't think anything could have freaked me out at that moment. I was ready to move on with my life for the first time in years. I'm writing this a few years after it all happened. It took me that long to really absorb and remember it all, and be able to properly retell it. Things have returned to normal. I have a girlfriend, not from Tinder. I have a new house. I have a life. All I have left of Alice and other memories. Well, I do have one physical item I did keep that I didn't tell Leisha that I did. I never got the little A tattoo Alison behind my earlobe removed. Every once in a while I'll wake up in the middle of the night with it itching and I wonder if it's Alison returning. Or just sending me a little hello. And then it goes away and I go back to sleep. I almost never see it. But I always know it's there. And that's perfect. So that was the story of I matched with my dead wife on Tinder. That's like a complete roller coaster of what happened. Like you can see at the beginning of the story, you know, he was skeptical of everything going on, but also you could see he was a bit of a dirtbag until things started really progressing and getting worse. But I think the story was, a, you know, it was it was nice that the story came full circle. I didn't know what to expect expect for the rest of the story. I didn't know if it was going to be like, you know he was going to die at the end or something like that you know as you usually get in some like ghost stories but there we go um so just leave in the comments uh if there's any uh like ghost stories you want me to read up on any urban myths uh that you want me to uh like to read in particular um or if you want me to try and do some digging about i can certainly try my best i'm not like the best at investigating those sort of things but i'm certainly interested in giving it a go so yeah i'm glad uh that you've made it this far as well and i really hope you did enjoy the video um remember as well please uh just like subscribe and uh we do stream some games as well every monday wednesday and friday at 8 30 p.m till about 11 30 p.m this is uk time as well so go into google and uh adjust it from there because really daylight saving and stuff and i'm not psychic when it comes to all the times in the world so yes thank you for watching and i will see you next time goodbye <laughs>